At the time of his opening ceremonies on May the 27th, 1937, the bridge spanning the Golden Gate was the longest and tallest suspension bridge ever built. Since surpassed in both those categories, it remains an aesthetic marvel, in part due to its design and the scenery that it spans. It has become a symbol of San Francisco, a favorite subject for photographers, a backdrop for filmmakers, and a major tourist destination. It has also been a favorite for suicides. Officials stopped counting when they reached 997 jumpers, fearful that continuing to keep an official count would encourage leapers to set a new record. Building it meant overcoming much more than the engineering obstacles the structure presented, which were formidable. Financial difficulties were equally vexing, magnified by the effects of the Great Depression. There was serious opposition to the project from the shipping industry, ferry services, and the United States Navy. Powerful railroad interests opposed its construction and sued in court to stop it from going forward. Its chief engineer and designer had no experience on a project of its size and none in building a suspension bridge. It took more than a decade just to gain sufficient support for construction to be Begin. Building the bridge also initiated strictly enforced safety standards for the workers, including wearing of hard hats, respirator masks for riveters, hand and face creams to protect exposed skin from the high winds encountered at elevation, and others. Another innovation was providing invigorating juices made with vinegar to men arriving for work while suffering from a hangover. Joseph Strauss, chief engineer for the project, wrote in the Saturday Evening Post following the bridge's completion, On the Golden Great Bridge, we had the idea we could cheat death by providing every known safety device for workers. Nonetheless, 11 men died during the bridge's construction. The one-mile-wide strait which affords access to San Francisco Bay was discovered by Spanish explorers in the 1770s. They named it the mouth of the port of San Francisco. Not until 1846 did American John Freeman give the strait the appellation of the Golden Gate. San Francisco's headlands make up the southern side of the gate. Marin County is the northern side. Crossing the strait was a daunting prospect even for experienced ferrymen, as the area was and is frequently enshrouded with heavy fog. Undercurrents, rills, and deadies pull watercraft away from their desired course and the Pacific tides are fast and powerful. Hundreds of ships and boats have been lost in the waters of the Straits and San Francisco Bay over the years. Bridging the Strait was a long dream of engineers, though the technology didn't exist. In the 1870s, railroad barons called for plans to bridge the Golden Gate, led by Charles Crocker, a founder of the Central Pacific Railroad and resident of San Francisco. Nothing came of the idea until 1919, when San Francisco officials assigned the city engineer Michael O'Shaughnessy to explore the feasibility of bridging the Strait. O'Shaughnessy reported that the engineers he consulted, who were willing to even consider the idea, were of the opinion such a bridge could not be built for less than $100 million or about $1.7 billion today. That is, except for a builder of drawbridges from Chicago named Joseph Strauss. Strauss had never built a suspension bridge, though he had studied the Roebling Suspension Bridge across the Ohio River while studying at the University of Cincinnati. He had built drawbridges in several locations across the country, having designed an entirely new type of counterweight system. In his opinion, a suspension bridge could be built to span the Golden Gate at a cost of less than $30 million. He delivered preliminary plans for a cantilever and suspension bridge in 1921. The plans were studied and rejected, not because they were unfeasible as pertained to engineering, but because the bridge was ugly. Meanwhile, as the 1920s wore on, automobile ownership and thus traffic exploded. Ferry services across the strait increased in profitability correspondingly. What had originally been conceived as a railroad bridge began to gain support as a highway bridge. Strauss consulted with bridge designers and engineers across the country and submitted modified plans calling for a suspension bridge with two towers, the bridge deck spanning four 4,200 feet between them. Political groups formed to support the bridge and find a means to pay for it. Inevitably, other political groups formed to oppose its construction. Ironically, though it was the railroads which had started the clamor to build the bridge across the Golden Gate, they became an early and powerful opponent to its construction. As ferrying across the strait became more profitable due to an increase in automobile traffic, the railroads bought up most of the ferry services. An automobile bridge would cut into their profit margins and was thus unacceptable. The powerful railroad lobby argued against the use of taxpayer money for the project. They were joined by the remaining ferry services that were not directly owned, who saw the bridge as a threat to their 
their livelihood. The shipping industry also joined, who looked at the bridge across the tricky waters of the strait as a hazard to navigation. Further opposition came from the United States Navy, which considered San Francisco their most important Pacific Coast port at the time, and contained the shipyards, or which built and maintained Navy ships and employed thousands. The Navy viewed a bridge as an opportunity for an enemy to deny access to San Francisco through sabotage or direct attack. They agreed with the shipping industry, arguing that an accident such as a collision with the bridge could effectively close the harbor for an unknown period of time. While the Navy lobbied against the bridge, San Francisco authorities and California legislatures were lobbying the Army to release lands under their control on which the bridge abutments would be located. By the mid-1920s, the Southern Pacific Railroad held a near monopoly on ferry services in and around San Francisco Bay. They filed suit to prevent a bridge across the strait, claiming it was taxpayer-supported action to deprive them of business. At the time, the Southern Pacific was one of the most powerful business entities in the U.S., to say nothing of the state of California. Finally, a large consortium of engineers and bridge builders argued that spanning the straits was likely an impossibility and certainly couldn't be done at the cost Strauss presented. Somehow, against this array of powerful interests opposing the bridge, preliminary work went forward. Gradually, the bridge gained its share of supporters. In 1923, the California legislature enacted the Golden Gate Bridge and Highway District Act, which enabled supporters for the bridge, including San Francisco and Marin County, to create a new district to complete a bridge. The following year, after the second of two hearings held by the War Department, it was agreed to transfer the land under army control to the district for the construction of the bridge and the roads leading to it. Officially, the U.S. Navy continued to oppose construction, but the Department of the Navy was separate from the War Department in those days, and the Army didn't care. When the final plans revealed the towers supporting the bridge deck would be separated by over 4,000 feet, leaving the straits clear, the Navy finally withdrew its objections, though it never supported the project, at least not publicly. The span itself was to offer 220 feet of clearance beneath at high tide, more than sufficient for the naval ships entering and exiting San Francisco Bay. However, support for the bridge was growing. The automobile industry supported the bridge, as it did most highway and bridge projects throughout the 1920s and 1930s. Gradually, all of the affected counties and municipalities, except Humboldt County, joined the bridge district in support of construction. Humboldt's voters feared the increase in vehicle traffic that the bridge would generate. Supporters of the bridge project expressed their disapproval of the Southern Pacific Railroad by launching a massed and successful boycott of its ferry services. The railroad suit intended to prevent the bridge from being built was dismissed. The bridge planners gained the support of the local construction unions and workers by guaranteeing local companies and labor would be given priority for jobs related to the project. That guarantee gained considerable sway when the Depression set in in late 1929. The onset of the Depression had another impact on the project, though it made obtaining financing for the project considerably more difficult. The final plans for the bridge called for a construction budget of $27 million. In order to obtain the financing, the bridge district had to request a bond measure of $30 million approved by the voters in the bridge district in November 1930. Once authorized to issue the bonds, the bridge district faced another problem. With the depression in full swing, there was little money with which to purchase the bonds. Another two years went by before the San Francisco-based Bank of America purchased the bulk of the bond levy. By the time construction was ready to begin, the budget had reached $35 million. McClintock Marshall Construction Company, a subsidiary of Bethlehem Steel Corporation, began construction on January 5, 1933, with Joseph Strauss as the project supervisor. Before the first concrete was poured for the South Anchorage, the San Francisco site, he placed a brick formerly used in the University of Cincinnati's McMichan Hall in the mold. The final design of the bridge included the two towers rising 746 feet to the top. The towers supported the cables which spanned the bridge, and they in turn supported the cables carrying the bridge deck. The loads are thus transferred via the cables to the towers and from the towers to bedrock. Cables likewise carry the loads to the anchorages. The cables were purchased from the John Roebling Company of Trenton, New Jersey, the same company that provided the cables for the Brooklyn Bridge and the Roebling Bridge across the Ohio River. The cables were purchased in the form of wire and spun into cables using 27,532 wires per three feet thick cable on the construction site. The entire bridge carried Art Deco themes in its design and decoration. In part to appease the Navy, the bridge was painted in a color known as International Orange to increase visibility in the notoriously misty and foggy bay. The Navy had requested that the bridge be painted with vertical black and yellow stripes. The orange was a compromise. 
Although Strauss claimed credit for the design and, in fact, tried to divert all credit for the project towards himself, it was Leon Moiseff who truly deserved the plaudits. Moiseff was the designer of the Manhattan Bridge in New York, as well as the original Tacoma Narrows Bridge, which broke apart in high winds shortly after its completion. Another engineer to contribute to the Golden Gate Bridge was Charles Ellis, who designed the arch over Fort Point on the southern side of the bridge. Strauss fired Ellis in the final design phase before construction began. He received little credit for his contributions until the 75th anniversary celebrations. The workers on the towers in the span encountered high and contrary winds while performing hard labor in dangerous circumstances. To mitigate the dangers, Strauss insisted on safe labor practices and that safety equipment was properly used. He ordered a safety net deployed under the 80 feet wingspan with an additional 10 feet extending to either side to prevent men from falling to near certain death. On February the 17th, 1937, a scaffolding holding 12 workers broke loose and fell through the net. Two of the men survived the fall of over 200 feet into the frigid water. The other 10 men did not. They were part of the total of 11 men who died during construction on the bridge. Another 19 were saved by the safety net over the course of construction. On November 18, 1936, two sections of the main span between the towers were joined. Work on the roadway across the span continued until April 19, 1937, when the bridge was declared complete. Finished or not, work continued with painting, installing decorative features, removing work scaffolding and equipment, installing lighting, and generally applying the finishing touches. By the end of April 1937, the Golden Gate Bridge was complete. After more than a decade of planning, fighting over, and building their bridge across the Golden Gate, the people of San Francisco and the Bridge District were not about to let their achievement go unnoticed. The week from May 27th through June the 2nd was designated Fiesta Week. Invitations were sent out to dignitaries from other cities to join San Francisco in its celebration. They were sent as being from the citizens of San Francisco and the Redwood Empire counties of California. An official program was prepared with Mayor Angelo Rossi of San Francisco writing in his greetings message, We have done our best and now submit the finished work for your approval. May 27th was designated pedestrian day. For a quarter, pedestrians could go out on the bridge while the entire deck was open. One could walk all the way across or simply go out on the span for the views before returning to the side entered from. The bridge had begun making money even before the first car had set wheels upon it. The following day, at noon, the Golden Gate Bridge was opened to vehicle traffic with President Franklin D. Roosevelt declaring it open via a telegraph key from Washington. At 3 p.m., the U.S. Navy fleet review arrived. Ten battleships and 13 heavy cruisers, supported by light cruisers, steam into port beneath the bridge. Among the cruisers was the USS Indianapolis, which just eight years later would deliver the atomic bomb to Tinian in the far Pacific. The rest of Fiesta Week featured baseball games between Navy ships teams, Army teams, and local schools. Trap and skeet contests were part of the celebration, so were contests in horseshoes, handball, bowling, tennis, and other various sports. Various marinas offered regattas, many ferry companies offered harbor tours, their main livelihood taken from them by the great orange structure, framing the opening to the bay. Memorial Day featured the relatively new sport of midget automobile racing. The advertisement in the official program promised crashes, smashes, and thrills. Newspaper accounts of the Fiesta celebration, as well as reports of completion of the bridge, said little about two facts which would make news today. The bridge was completed ahead of schedule and over $1.3 million under budget. The bridge had been funded entirely by the bond issue. No tax money went into its construction. Strauss had been right all along. He celebrated his achievement by writing a poem titled, The Mighty Task is Done. Exhausted by the project, Strauss died within a year of its completion, most likely as the result of a stroke. During the Fiesta celebrations, flights of U.S. Navy aircraft flew over the bridge in formation, a scene of martial splendor launched from offshore aircraft carriers. In 1942, Richard Bong, America's leading ace of World War II, performed a loop which included flying under the Golden Gate Bridge in a P-38 Lightning Fighter airplane. Bong was one of four U.S. Army Air Corps pilots who performed the feat that day and was reprimanded for his act, which included flying down Market Street at low altitude, blowing the laundry off a clothesline. His reprimand was not too severe. General George Kenny told him, You are not to do it anymore, and I mean what I say. The first known suicide from jumping from the bridge occurred in August 1937. A World War I veteran named Harold Wobber jumped from the bridge before a witness who tried unsuccessfully to stop him. Since then, an estimated 1,800 suicides and at least one murder suicide have occurred on the bridge, earning it the designation as the most popular suicide site in the world. It has also been used to fake suicides by leaving evidence of jumping, including a suicide note. One such fake in 1948 featured a recently elected San Francisco Board of Supervisors member, Chris Christiansen. Christiansen was later found alive in Houston, Texas, making a living by selling Bibles. 
Suicide barriers and safety nets have been installed, though the installation is not yet finished. The bridge is patrolled, and maintenance workers are trained to identify and, if necessary, intervene with those looking to use the bridge as a suicide spot. The bridge also contains numerous signs with numbers for suicide prevention hotlines and crisis intervention specialists. The bridge has been destroyed in at least 13 motion pictures by aliens, earthquakes, solar radiation, monsters, meteors, tsunamis, and a nuclear missile. Godzilla destroyed the bridge in the 2014 film of that name, ripping through the span. It's been used as a backdrop in scores of other films since the early 1940s. In 1986's Star Trek IV The Voyage Home, Sulu does Richard Bong one better and flies a Klingon bird of prey under the bridge. Then, of course, James Bond battles an enemy, Zora in on top of the bridge in a view to kill. In real life, the bridge has withstood earthquakes, although it has recently been refitted to give it an even higher probability of surviving a major quake. Its biggest enemy over its 85 years has been the salt air and water which make up its environment and the wear and tear of the traffic it has carried around the clock for all of that time. Each year, approximately 40 million vehicles traverse the bridge, leading to major maintenance requirements. Painting and maintenance work is a daily event on the bridge, with periodic major maintenance and repair activities added to it. To maintain and operate the bridge, it employs 800 workers full-time. The Golden Gate Bridge isn't going anywhere, but that doesn't mean it doesn't move. Though it weighs an astounding 840 million tons, it nonetheless moves in the windy environment in which it was built. Winds have caused the bridge to close in the past, mostly for vehicular safety, and they also caused the bridge to flex. It can flex quite a bit. The span has moved sideways up to 27 feet on particularly windy days. The designers and engineers knew their stuff when they decided to cross the Golden Gate Bridge with a steel and concrete structure. Walking trails lead to the bridge, allowing those so inclined to walk to and across it. Pedestrian access is typically limited to just one side of the bridge and only until about 6 p.m., though hours are extended during the months when daylight savings time is in effect. In its long history, the Golden Gate Bridge has closed just eight times. Three were for high winds. In 1975, the bridge was closed to replace cables, and twice on its 50th and 75th anniversaries, it was closed to vehicle traffic to allow full access to pedestrians. During the 50th anniversary, the bridge was so crowded with people that the deck was flattened in the center of the span, dropping an estimated seven feet. It was undamaged, once again establishing the validity of its original design. To further improve the original design, the bridge has been retrofitted with modern means of resisting earthquake damage and with materials better able to withstand the corrosive environment that it occupies. The bridge is a true American icon, linked with San Francisco in song, literature, film, and of course, photography. Fromer's travel guide has called the bridge certainly the most photographed bridge in the world. Its image appears on coffee cups and drinking glasses, coins and medallions, on t-shirts, coasters, jackets, magazine covers, and advertisements of all types. But in addition to San Francisco, it is linked to all of America. During World War II, it was the last site of home for servicemen and women when deploying from San Francisco, and the first site of home when returning from the Pacific War. Whether it will stand into the 23rd century, as the Star Trek franchise seems to predict, is unknown. The old London Bridge, built in the Middle Ages, stood for over 600 years, supported by a wooden piles sunk deep beneath the Thames. So there is certainly a precedent for a bridge lasting for centuries. Will the Golden Gate Bridge become yet another? Well, only time will tell.